Welcome, all of you on stage. Allow me first to introduce the two newcomers. Uh, with us, we have Gun Enli. She is a professor in media studies at the Department of Media and Communication, University of Oslo. She teaches and focuses her research on media policy, um, political communication, and participatory media. Enli has written seven books, of which three are published internationally. Catherine Tollefson. She holds a PhD in anthropology from the London School of Economics. So we're almost having an alumni meeting here as I'm there from there as well. Um, she is currently a researcher at the C-Rex Center for Research on Extremism at the University of Oslo. And her research focuses on nationalism, migration and identity. So this is probably, in Norway right now, the group of people that know most about this, uh, this uh, issue, these subjects. So I think you will all be smarter and more enlightened after this discussion. At least that's my ambition. <laughs> um, well, as we, as we are here, as we speak, right-wing populists are in power both in Hungary, in Poland, in Austria, they will become a part of the government. In Germany, the AFP became the third largest party. In France, Front National, became the second largest party, and we see strong support for right-wing populists in the Netherlands, in Sweden, here in Norway, our version of this party is in government, and of course, there's Trump. Um, what's your take on this? Are they progressing? Will we see more, will they have more power in the years to come? I would like to start with you, Dr. Fieschi. Thank you. Um, are they progressing? I think it's a two-part answer. The first part of the answer is that others are regressing. Um, one of the things that we need to take into account, certainly in Europe, is that often the rise of right-wing populists coincides with the near annihilation of left parties on the political spectrum. If I think of what happened to uh, the left party in the Netherlands, what happened to the Socialist Party um, in, in France, um, you know, even in, in, in Germany, <coughs> the SPD. Um, so there, there, is, there is something here that we need to take into account, which is that um, clearly the sort of left parties, whether they be socialist or social democratic, are failing to offer the kinds of messages and solutions and um, the kind of protection, I think, um, that, a lot of these, that a lot of these voters want. You know, it's, it's, it's quite, this, this is a, a relatively clear tendency. And then I think that the second part of the answer is that, you know, yes, they, they are progressing in the sense that they have been very, very good at broadening their appeal. What I mentioned in my talk, which was that, you know, they have now really rather diverse electorates um, and growingly diverse electorates, not just they've moved from electorates on the right to electorates that you would have expected to vote potentially on the left, but also um, they're increasingly uh, broadening their appeal uh, toward women. They used to be much more male. They're actually uh, also broadening their uh, the, the, the voter age profile. Um, so I think you know that, yes, yes, I'm afraid they are progressing. <laughs> Catherine Tolaifson? So, do you share yes. well, Definitely, and they are offering culture and economic protectionism. So I think that's key. And I think we can divide it between also looking at major transformations in the economy and demography. So it's not just related to the crisis of displacement or the financial recession, but the crisis of displacement and the so-called refugee crisis, which accelerates the migration from Muslim-majority countries, provided a perfect storm for the populist radical right, because it gave that impression that Europe is being flooded by non-Europeans. So that's when nativist populism really got its, its moment. But it, I agree, this is nothing new. They have been around for a long time, and we need to analyze them in relation to, to these longer major transformations in economy and demography. Um, we see, and I think your, spe your speech was a very good example on that, uh, Marovic, that the new media has been a part of their success. And why do right-wing populists handle that kind of communication so much better than traditional parties does? Well, this is really a different form of the far right than we have previously seen in the United States because it is so young. So many of the people participating in these online communities are teenagers or in their 20s. And these are people who are very 
conversant at internet culture. They're really familiar with the aesthetics of young people's internet culture, of memes, of video games, of humor, slang, irony. And they're able to position these beliefs as somehow edgy and rebellious. That if you've been told that diversity is good, that being anti-diversity allows you to put a stake in the ground of being rebellious and edgy, which I think really appeals to a lot of young people as that sort of call to rebelliousness. So it's not, it's, it's almost like this is a movement that is coming up from the ground of people who spend most of their social life on the internet, they spend most of their time there, and they're just really good at using the internet to recruit other like-minded people. And I think it sort of remains to be seen how this will translate to people beyond that particular strata of like internet obsessed young people. Um, but I think that the, the way that they're able to tailor their messages to more mainstream audiences um, is, is actually quite, it's, it's almost like a really good advertising agency or a really good like branding agency that can take a political message or, and target it to different subgroups. Um, these young people are able to do very similar things. And I think that's partly just because they understand the internet in a very deep way that a lot of older, more traditional um, political actors don't. Gun and Le, would you comment on that? Yes, I, I do agree also. I would point to the fact that social media, uh, for example, Facebook and Twitter, they, there are certain characteristics uh, or media logics in, in these platforms which are really um, converging a bit with populist ideology in the sense that there's a preference for um, more fragmented arguments, short messages, tabloid messages, personalization, um, polarization, and immers uh, emotional uh, messages. And also in social media, the authentic voice, the kind of gut feeling that you get the sense that the politician means what he or she says that they are spontaneous, that they are not afraid of saying what they really mean, that they are giving the real talk instead of the official talk, things like that makes social media an arena that has been kind of um, um, an advantage for some populist politicians. But to follow up on that, because of course all these tools are open for everyone. So why haven't the other parties, the more traditional parties, been able to use the same channels? It's basically because traditional parties are precisely that. They are parties and therefore they are more complex in how they communicate. Uh, they have more complex structures, more people are involved in communication. Uh, they, are, uh, they have all, often more complex also ideologies because populists, they don't have a coherent ideology often. It's easier to give the fragmented messages, it's easier to be tabloid, and also it's easier to be personalized and personal and authentic for a um, populist politician in, in this media environment. As you explained, the media environment is really important how it works, the dynamic between uh, new media and established media. Mm. Can I just, uh, of course, come into that as well? Um, I think that one of the things that's uh, also very interesting is that most mainstream political uh, leaders would, I would say that they would reluctantly lie, right? Not because they're necessarily better people or more ethical people, but they know that they're being watched. Uh, with you know heightened scrutiny, so they they're more much more afraid I think of being of being caught red-handed. What's interesting about populists and you know um, right-wing populists in in particular, but even left-wing populists, somebody like Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who's leader of the far-left populist party um, in France, um, but if you if you look at uh, somebody like Jean-Marie Le Pen, um, you know former leader of the of the Front National. These people lied, they lied on camera, they changed their minds. When they were caught out lying, they'd say, so what? You know, I mean, it's quite reminiscent of actually what Trump did, mm -hmm. so what? They have, they know that they have 
an electoral base that is far more tolerant of this kind of behavior, and not only tolerant of this kind of behavior, but I think actually welcomes this kind of behavior in a sense of, you know, they're a bit of a maverick. They don't have to care in the same way that, you know, all these scared mainstream politicians. Actually, the lying and, you know, the the kind of the demeanor is something that plays into this personality. So I think that one of the reasons that they haven't been as good is because uh, in the mainstream parties is because they, they can't play that game in the same way. Uh, yes, and they're extremely good at also essentializing. Yeah. And they even essentialized the uh, constituency, so appealing to the little man and the ordinary and authentic people. We know that the electorate is very diverse. But if you look about how they appeal after the victory, is this is a victory for ordinary men, for ordinary women. The authentic nation will never be forgotten again. And at the same time, they also essentialize migrants and minorities. So it's this double form of essentialization in the campaigns. So it's not just that complexity gets reduced, but it's also in, in their communications. Yeah. Yeah. Enli, you had a comment? Yes, I just wanted to add that um, the new media platforms are always uh, a bit alternative. They are fighting against something, and they are representing a participatory culture that makes people uh, included in the public sphere, makes new voices uh, able to express themselves. And all these are good things, and the things that we want to be used for the positive good for democracy. But the fact that things like this all always have a flip side, that the accessibility, the inclusiveness, um, and the participatory platforms, they always also have a negative side that invites uh, the kind of strong forces that feels, uh, rightly or not, forgotten by the mainstream media, that now finally they have found their arenas and that they can express themselves and come across as the real people. We tell the truth. This is our truth. And some of these people, they really believe that they have the truth and that the mainstream liberal media are fake. Do you agree with this, Marvin? Yeah, I do agree with that analysis. I think that there is a sense that the, the promise of social media, I think, was that it would allow for greater activist participation. But I think what a lot of internet scholars failed to see was that that meant people across the political spectrum, including people that we wouldn't necessarily agree with. Um, but I think that there is a sense that these actors are not necessarily disingenuous. They're not necessarily just trying to spread false information. They honestly believe in the conspiracies or the, 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 the theories about you know, Hillary Clinton murdering someone. Like, they really believe this is true, and so they're motivated very strongly to get that information out to the public as a result. Um, can I ask you, Andy, in, in Norway, and you know, looked at some uh, American examples, if you were to talk about this for, a, for an American uh, audience, what would, there, would be the examples you would use from Norway? Well, the Norwegian media system is very different from the United States, for sure, but also from the UK uh, and Europe. Uh, Nordic media is very distinct, and we have a different system, uh, more universalism, um, less polarization, uh, more egalitarian media systems. This means that we have, to a large degree, included um, political viewpoints and opinions outside of the political consensus into the public sphere. And now they are in government. So this is very different. And the media are important for understanding this, why the political system is different and the media system, they are related. But nevertheless, we also have uh, the Progress Party uh, uh, as an example of how uh, populist uh, politicians use social media uh, with their um, messages. And in, in Norway also, they, the Progress Party use, uh, they use Facebook. They use the mainstream social media where the people are. They don't go the way through Twitter because Twitter is more elitist or more intellectual, more, <coughs> um, yes, more exclusive in a way. Mm -hmm. So Facebook is for everyone, and that's where you find the populist parties. And they are more also engaged in dialogue with users, 
They go in there, they communicate, and they have simple messages, polarized messages, and they use the anti-media uh, argument often. They criticize mainstream media and put themselves across as the honest voice uh, of uh, common sense. Uh, so it's much of the same rhetoric, actually. Um, mm -hmm. Pieski? I just, I just thought that it would be worth, you know, um, pointing out that we are talking about relatively different phenomena here, right? So it's true that the Progress Party use Facebook, whereas, you know, some of the people that you were talking about um, use very different mm -hmm. sites and very different um, uh, tools. But I think that, you know, the Progress Party, you know, probably needs to be compared with the Tea Party, mm -hmm. you know, rather than to be compared with, you know, some of the some of the characters that, that, that you were talking about. Now, what's interesting is how these different spheres influence one another. Yes. I think, you know, that, the, you know, and that comes across quite clearly from your presentation, that actually there's a strategy of taking these ideas that are way out there, you know, and then, you know, making them trickle across, if you like, more and more and more mainstream sites. But in terms of who's using what tools and, and, um, and what messages they're putting out, I mean, I think, you know, the populists are out about, you know, to talk common sense. Your guys are not out to talk about common sense. They're really talking about conspiracy. Yeah, in a right? lot of ways. And I think that the, the use of more mainstream sites, like I think your point that Twitter is used by journalists and elites is very true because mm -hmm. I think that a lot of the media manipulation goes on on Twitter because journalists are often looking for story ideas on Twitter. They're looking to see what's trending, they're looking to see what people are talking about. And that's true of journalists like all over the world are using Twitter to talk to each other and to keep up with what different people are doing. Your average American, your average Norwegian is not using Twitter in that same way. So Twitter is used to, to seed stories to journalists or to try to influence the elites, whereas other sites like Facebook are used more to like organize like a Tea Party rally or put out a flyer or spread like a, a news story from one of these fake news sources that's just like your, your garden variety pro-Trump story. Yeah. I also want to, because uh, I see we are, the time is, is going fast, um, because we have of course, we're talking now about the methods they use. We touched upon uh, why are people attracted uh, I think it's also worth a discuss, have a few a conversation on, on what do they actually want? Because uh, if you see in, in Europe, in Poland and Hungary, where they actually you have right-wing populist parties in government, we see that they are using their power to almost dismantle the, the court system. They are, uh, um, they are pushing down the free press, civil society, out of uh, an ideology saying that we are the people and all we are the democracy is that we govern and all these other things are just in the way of the, of the will of the people. So it's, it's, it's very, um, quite scary to observe and I would like to hear your comments on, on how do you think that ideology, how important is that for these other um, movements in other countries? Would we do to start on that? I mean, I think that um, different Different parties want different things and different leaders want different things. So what, one of the things, for example, that's quite striking is that somebody like Herr Wilders is not that interested in governing, right? What he's interested is creating a bit of chaos and disruption and, you know, undermining and delegitimizing, you know, the other political parties, bringing down governments. You know, it's almost agitprop, right? He, you know, whereas somebody like Marine Le Pen is really interested in governing. She's really interested in getting into, into power. She's not kidding. She's not interested in just, you know, creating a bit of disruption. And I think that one of the things that we see, whether it's her who has uh, you know, failed for now um, and is in, in, a bad, in bad shape, the party's in bad shape, right? Um, or whether we look at somebody like Orban, right? I mean, here, what we see is a combination of things. We, want the, we see people who really want to get into power. They don't just want to push other parties, 
you know, to espouse their views. They want to be in power. They want to create institutional change. Institutional change that actually creates other types of political change, you know, changes the laws, changes the judicial system, changes the immigration and the asylum, uh, uh, the asylum system. So, you know, we, they, they are vast, you know, they have different motivations, but I think the ones that are, and again, I put the Progress Party slightly, um, you know, in a slightly different category here, because interestingly enough, they're the only ones who haven't self-destructed right um when they've when they've come into power now let's see what happens we'll see what happens in austria you know when uh you know they probably have to govern together or the ifd but so far the progress party are the only ones who've actually you know in a sense come to terms with what it means to be a party in government and not actually call into question the fundamentals of the system in other places they are calling into question the fundamentals of the system they do want institutional change well, I think Hungary is a good case study because you see an authoritarian populist in power and also the attack on the checks and balances on democracy. And there's also this united in nostalgia for the good old days. So rejecting the progressive values of the European Union, rejecting the progressive values of the Labour Party and going back to the heteronormative family as the unit for the nation. And you see the same renationalization processes in Poland, where you see this thickening of, of the nationalism, which is really focused on um, the nuclear family as the basis for, for, for the nation. Yeah. Hmm. Would anyone else comment on that? Um, you ask what do they want. Mm -hmm. I would say, in terms of the media, they want a voice and they want definition power. Uh, they want also to fight intellectual uh, rhetoric and the complex rhetoric. They, they want to have the kind of simple arguments mm. come across. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think simple arguments well describes Trump. You know, his idea that you can just build a wall, like you said, or um, drain the swamp, like those are very simplistic arguments. And Trump himself has no political experience. Like he's a very ineffective politician. He's not been able to get any of his policies or his propositions through. And he's also met with enormous waves of resistance from the rest of the American population. Um, so I think that the alt-right or the far-right are really defined in opposition to establishment institutions in general. So I think that their goal is to really undermine a lot of the traditions of liberal democracy in the United States, like the free press, um, like a functioning, <laughs> like voting, right? Like all of these things that we sort of take for granted. They've been trying to undermine things like the U.S. Census, like all of these institutions that we thought were, you know, were, were very functional parts of... Um, of American civil society. So I think that in many ways it's more about tearing anything down than building anything up. I'm not sure that they have coherent propositions about like the way that the world should look. It's really more that they know that they don't want it to look the way that it is now. Mm. Yes, and they also want their concerns addressed. So their anxiety about the impact on migration or on their culture and way of life. And you know, when Trump re re refers to them as, or Hillary Clinton as deplorables or lunatics, whatever, that's, that's also a rejection of their, their legitimate sometimes concerns. So I think that's key to really manage to address the concerns of, of these voters. Yeah. Dr. Vieski, you have tried to, to put up a list of what to do. How should we come to this? <laughs> um, well, I think that there's, there's, um, there's a number of things that are really important. One is that, you know, I always say we don't have to listen necessarily, but we have to hear. Um, and to do that, we need to engage much more effectively than we have done. I think, you know, if one of the things that the Macron campaign shows us in France is that actually, you know, you can run a campaign and engage with people's concerns and actually turn up in the places where they are particularly angry and you can actually engage and have the argument rather than think that you know you really have to keep all this at arm's length you know George Bernard Shaw said that you should never wrestle with a pig because you get dirty and the pig enjoys it right <laughs> um, you know and I think I mean I think it's a it's a great soundbite 
fight, but I actually think that we need to wrestle, <laughs> right? I think that we need to roll up the sleeves, and, and, and I think that you know, one of the reasons that Macron was effective was that despite the fact that you know, former banker, elite, etc., etc., actually, you know, he, was, he did the thing which is exactly against an, an elitist uh, stance. He went out, he had the argument, he faced off with the, the voters who were angry, with the people who were threatening to actually vote for Marine Le Pen and, and with Marine Le Pen. And you know, if any of you had saw any clips of the French debate between Macron and Marine Le Pen, she lost that night. The pig lost, right? So sometimes it's worth wrestling with them. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Marvik? What, what should be done? I mean, I think that this is a complicated problem with a lot of complicated solutions. Um, in the U.S., there's a lot of focus on social media companies' role in this. But I think we also need to look at the mainstream media in the U.S.'s role um, and the pressures on journalists, um, the economic pressures, the lack of local media in many places, the lack of a strong publicly funded media in the United States. And a lot of the more sensational claims that are floating around are floating around not only in social media, but they do exist in mainstream media like Fox News as well. And I think until there's media reform, like media landscape reform in the US, I think that we're going to continue to see manipulation of the media by a variety of different groups. So my recommendations, a lot of them would be around media reform. I do believe that we need to meet a lot of these disenfranchised young people where they are, um, understand their concerns beyond just, you know, whatever their spewing online, like what is it missing in their life or what are, are the, the problems that they're having? Like the US doesn't have much of a social safety net. We don't have much um, help with student loans or mental health issues or other things that are of great concern to young people. And I think these problems need to be addressed structurally and systematically rather than seeing a quick fix by just kicking people off of Facebook. In, in Andy, in Norway, we are, you know, you have to admit that we're always a little bit behind. Uh, usually, um, and also we are just now in the middle of a big transformation in the Norwegian media. We are also getting sites like Dokument.nu um, restart. Uh, do you see the same development in Norway as we see in the US, or is there something that could be done to stop it? Well, I don't think we will uh, repeat the same pattern because the long tradition of Norwegian media system is very different, as I said, and it's it, it wouldn't be as the U.S. system with, <laughs> even though the, the um, internet is global, social media are global, but they are always connected to the local uh, public sphere, the local media system. So we, we see some changes, but there are also important continuities. Um, and the level of trust is still higher in Norway than compared to the U.S., for example, in the media. But of course, we, we need to be aware of this, and we need to rethink also how we embrace uh, new fragmented areas, and, and we need to protect editorial media and, and part of the Norwegian tradition for, for how to sustain um, democratic good media and the press. Hmm. What do you think, what should be done? To take voters uh, seriously and address their concern about the impact of, of uh, fast change on their lives, and in particular migration. And I also think, at the same time, to, to strengthen critical thinking and strengthen also the values of democracy and uh, be able to debunk myths and conspiratorial thinking about mm. minorities in particular. Mm. The last comment. I just, I, I think that... One of the things that we need to really take seriously is that across the countries that we've studied, education levels correlate positively with people supporting the values of uh, various forms of liberal democracy. I'm conscious, conscious of where we're sitting here today. You know, we used to think of education, traditionally we think of education as something that prepares you for a good professional life. We need to start thinking also of making sure that people have as much education and as long as possible because it acts as a vaccine to have a healthy democratic life, a healthy political life. This is where we need to spend more money. When I see that, you know, in the UK we have raised universities 
raised university fees. You know, we're, we're cutting subsidies for teachers and, and teacher training and so on and so forth. This is, this is the exact opposite of what we should be doing because if there's one thing we know is education inoculates you against this kind of politics. <laughs> that was <easy. laughs> There must be some university people in the audience, I think. Well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, we, have to, we have to sum up, but I'd like to just a short uh, question to all of you. Should we be worried? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> short answer. <laughs> you want me to say uh, yes, but I say no. Okay. okay. <laughs> Why? Because uh, we have seen uh, new media before. We have been afraid before uh, when new media arrives, when new political uh, voices arrive. We are, uh, of course, trembling, fear arises. But I, I see that th there are also hope. And of course, it's, it's more, from my perspective, as a Norwegian scholar, uh, it's easier to say no. <laughs> and I'll have some. Uh, yes and no, and it's all contextual. <laughs> <laughs> that was the social anthropologist, that's very good. Um, our time is out, so we will take that positive, slightly gloomy um, outlook with us. What is for sure, the phenomenon is not going away, so all strong believers in liberal democracies need to engage. So thank you to the panel, and thank you for everybody who came, and I hope to see you all next year.